Thank you so much, Spice and Larry. I swear Larry's uh, like Jimmy Kimmel. I mean, he can imitate how many people, right? Leonard Cohen, Johnny Cash, Bruce Springsteen, and of course he has his own beautiful voice. Thank you, Larry. In December, I had the honor of officiating at the wedding of two women from Pennsylvania. They have lived as spouses for over 30 years, but the state of Pennsylvania still does not recognize their relationship. So they came to Maryland for a marriage license and for a wedding. And we created a personal celebration with photographs and songs from their 30-year relationship. After the wedding, they presented me with a CD of Leonard Cohen Live in London. They hoped that I didn't already have it. I said, no, and I'm so grateful. How did you know that I loved the songs on this album, Dance Me to the End of Love, Anthem, Alleluia, and If It Be Thy Will? How did you know that I listened to these songs on YouTube? <laughs> and one of the brides answered, well, your email signature quoted him on this album. <laughs> I've studied deeply into philosophies and religions, but cheerfulness kept breaking through. And this was so true. During this 2008 concert in London, Leonard Cohen had shared, it's been 15 years since I've been on stage. I was 60 then, just a young kid with a crazy dream. <laughs> Then I took a lot of Prozac and Zoloft and Wellbutrin, Ritalin, Exifor. I studied all the religions and philosophies of the world, too. But somehow, cheerfulness just kept breaking through. <laughs> My own introduction to the songs of Leonard Cohen came only a few years ago through the movie Shrek and his song, <laughs> Alleluia. I was moved not only by Cohen's major and minor chords, his holy and his broken alleluias, but also by his interweaving of biblical and personal stories. And I wondered, who is this spiritual seeker? So for those of you not familiar with him, Leonard Cohen will turn 80 this year. He was born to Jewish parents in Montreal. He described his childhood as very decent, but when he was nine, his father died. At less than 10 years old, Leonard Cohen marked this turning point in his life journey by creating his own ritual. He wrote a message to his father and buried it with one of his father's ties. Leonard Cohen learned at an early age that we are never not broken. He said, I think we develop images of ourselves quite early on. And certainly one of the images I had of myself came from reading Chinese poetry at a very young age. There was a kind of solitary figure in some of those poems by Li Po and Tu Fu, a monk sitting by a stream. There was a notion of solitude, a notion of deep appreciation for personal relationships, a deep longing to experience and to describe friendship and loss and the consequence of distance. After graduating from McGill University, Cohen himself sought to describe loss by publishing a book of poems dedicated to his late father. His life journey took him to a geographically distant land. He moved to the Aegean island Hydra to write. But his editor told him his first novel was tedious. Cohen began to show symptoms of clinical depression. The woman he was living with handed him his guitar. Leonard Cohen stared out the window as telephone poles and wires went up. He had moved to this Greek island because there had been no electricity, no telephones. He wanted to live as people had in the 11th century. And now technology was encroaching. He noticed how birds came to the wires. And he wrote first the words, then the melody to, like a bird on the wire, like a drunk in a midnight choir, I have tried in my way to be free. Leonard Cohen played Judy Collins a few of his songs in the mid-1960s. At the same time, he was telling Canadian TV, I wake up every morning and check if I am in a state of grace. If not, I go back to bed. 
Judy Collins recorded several of Collins' songs, and he quickly became known as a songwriter's songwriter. The first time he performed his own songs in 1967 at an anti-Vietnam War concert, he was so nervous he ran off the stage. Collins and the chanting crowd persuaded him to return to the microphone. Ironically, three years later, he was the least nervous performer in the midst of the social unrest on Desolation Hill in London in 1970. The other musicians feared for their safety. But Leonard Cohen came out and told the crowd of over 600,000, some of whom had paid for tickets for the concert, some who were squatters, some who were anarchists. He told these 600,000 people essentially a bedtime story about his father. When he was seven years old, he told them his father had taken him to the circus. And during the circus, a man had stood up and said, would everybody light a match so we can locate one another? Cohen then invited all 600,000 to light a match in order to, quote, sparkle like fireflies, unquote. And the people did not to set fire, not to riot or be destructive, but to generate light and warmth and peace. Leonard Cohen told them, it's good to be here alone in front of 600,000 people. And then he began to sing slowly, like a bird on the wire, like a drunk in a midnight choir. I have tried in my way to be free. He let the light shine in by sharing an experience of brokenness from his own life. He let the light shine in by inviting people to shine their own lights instead of throwing Molotov cocktails. He let the light shine in by acknowledging social brokenness and how it had erupted into violence in the previous days. And he let the light shine in by offering the protesters the mantra, let us renew ourselves now. Comparing Leonard Cohen to his contemporaries, Leo Libovitz writes, his peers all insisted that salvation was at hand. To go to a Doors concert was to stare at the live Messiah undressing on stage and believe that it was entirely possible to break on through to the other side. <laughs> to see Cohen play was to balk at an aging Jew telling you that life was hard and laced with sorrow, but that if we love each other, and have the mad courage to laugh, even when the sun is clearly setting, will be just all right. Leonard Cohen's search for peace both inside himself and in the wider world continued in the 1970s when he flew to Tel Aviv to lend his hand in the Yom Kippur War between Israel and Egypt. His original plan was to join the Israeli army, but he ended up entertaining the troops with eight shows a day. Cohen continued to record songs, which he described as muffled prayers, but he also continued to experience brokenness in his personal relationships with women, in a professional relationship with Phil Spector, who, drunk at 4 a.m. in a recording session, put a gun to Leonard Cohen's head and said, I love you, Leonard prompting Cohen to quip, I hope you do, Phil. <laughs> and he experienced brokenness in the betrayal by his former business manager who stole virtually all of Cohen's money, forcing him out of retirement. His songs trace his journey with brokenness with images as concrete as those in Victoria Safran's meditation. Only Cohen mixes religious and secular metaphors. In his song, Boogie Street, he sings, Though all the maps of blood and flesh are posted on the door, there's no one who has told us yet what Boogie Street is for. Like Leah in her letter to Roque, Leonard Cohen spent 50 years seeking to understand himself, but with much more muted humor. He struggled in his own words for significance and self-respect for righteous employment, to be doing the right thing. And as we heard in our reading, Leonard Cullen's spiritual quest took him to live in a Zen monastery for five years, 
just as he had found it good to be alone singing with 600,000 people on Desolation Hill, he found it good to be alone with the community of monks on that Baldy Zen Center outside of Los Angeles. There, the routine of meditation and service to others helped him to accept the never-not-brokenness of human existence. His mentor Roshi gave him a new name, Jikan, that translated to ordinary silence. In the Zen community, after years of antidepressants and study of the world's religions and philosophies, cheerfulness did indeed break through for Leonard Cohen. He remembers there was just a certain sweetness to daily life that began asserting itself. He continued, I remember sitting in the corner of my kitchen, which has a window overlooking the street. I saw the sunlight that shines on the chrome fenders of the cars and thought, gee, that's pretty. Colin, whose friend Irving Layton once described him as a narcissist who hates himself, <laughs> concluded that his Zen practice, both meditation and service to the community, helped him to stop thinking about himself all the time or rather to stop seeing everything from the viewpoint of his own suffering. All those hours of meditation and silence helped him to live in the moment as well as to transcend the moment. It took Leonard Cohen three to ten years to compose many of his most well-known songs like Anthem and Alleluia, but now he walks in beauty, at ease with himself, in a state of grace, whether singing a holy or a broken hallelujah. I was reminded of Leonard Cohen's spiritual journey, attending my 35th high school reunion a couple of weeks ago. I had not seen some of my classmates since I was Leah's age. As we shared reminiscences about six of our classmates who had died, four of them before we were 40, we also indirectly shared reminiscences about the images we had of ourselves as adolescents, and those we have of ourselves today. We spoke of our own experiences of never not broken, marriages which had failed, parents who had died, children and grandchildren who were struggling, career changes and moves. With different words and in different voices, what I heard was a deep longing to experience and to describe friendship and loss and the consequence of distance, as well as promises exchanged to be in better touch and to be present to and for one another in the future. We are never not broken. This is what Leonard Cohen affirms. We are never not broken. Don't be afraid of cracks and imperfections. Our brokenness is how light gets in and sometimes how light shines out. So dare to sing a broken hallelujah, dare to sing a holy hallelujah. When we share our humanity in community, we heal and are healed. In affirmation of this, let us join in singing our closing hymn. Number 346.